Uh, next up, we have Aaron Carroll with uh, Transparent HTTP with Apache Traffic Server. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so yes, we're going to be talking about transparent HTTP with that uh, using Apache Traffic Server. Uh, I'm Alan Carroll. I'm a PSC on the Traffic Server project. I started working on Traffic Server a while ago. Uh, done some various works. Uh, I work for a company called Network Geographics that does ATS and other development services. Um, so what are we trying to do here? Uh, what I've found when I work with people on transparency is that you have two types of people, people who say, I have no idea where to start, and people say, I don't know how to make it work. So we're going to try to address both of those. So my main goal here is to give you a starting point for deploying traffic server in transparent mode, to give you basic tools, basic strips to get started. A full implementation and getting it deployed is way beyond the scope that we can do in an hour. So I'm going to be providing some sample scripts. Uh, what I'm going to talk about in the talk mainly is what those commands and those scripts are actually supposed to do, what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, if you want to look ahead at the scripts to ask me questions about them, that's fine. We're not really going to cover them in here. Uh, and I'm going to try to provide some guides, some useful tools that you can use both to bring up uh, traffic server in this mode and to help figure out what's going on when things are going wrong. Um, so the basic outline of the talk is we're going to talk about some basic theory, you know, uh, what is a proxy, what is transparency. Uh, from there, we're going to drill down into increasing detail because I want to help you try to actually get this deployed. So uh, one of the main goals is get you to a place where you can start on this and get it out in the field. So we're going to cover, cover troubleshooting as well. Uh, when you try to get out there, the odds are it's not going to work because some of this is pretty tricky stuff. So what can you do to try to fix it after you're out there? And as I noticed we're not going to talk about the commands very much directly. I've got the scripts. It really just bogs down the talk if I bring that up. Uh, what's important here is that you understand what the, these commands are trying to do. Uh, so let's start with the basic theory. So what are we trying to do? Why do we want to put transparent HTTP up? So let's start with some basics so that we're not all on the same page. I'm going to go through this material, this beginning material, fairly quickly. It's, you have to understand this to understand the later slides, but we already all know this. We can just go through this at high speed. Uh, so we're going to use standard client-server terminology of a client. It makes connections to the server. And this is how the user thinks it works. They don't understand why the IT people have problems. This is so simple. Um, and transparency, what's going to help us with is maintaining this illusion for our users, right? Because really, they shouldn't know any more than that if we're doing our jobs. OK, but we're, we're going to be responsible for actually putting this out there. So we have to take a slightly more sophisticated view and understand, look at these connections as two half connections. So we have a connection in effect, from the client to the server and then back. Uh, these are identified in AP land by a five tuple, but we're HTTP, which is TCP. So in effect, we always have a four tuple, uh, which is local address port and the remote address and port. We're going to use local and remote in a viewpoint-based way. So if I'm on the client side, my local address is the address that's on me, and the remote address is the address that's on the other side. OK? And if we mean client address, then we'll say explicitly client address. So well, what's a proxy? So uh, Igor covered this already, but we'll go through it again. Uh, what the point of a proxy is, you want to modify the network traffic. We've got traffic going through from client to service, and we want to change it somehow. So we need to intercept the connections and make changes in it. And these changes are all a wide variety of things. Some people do filtering. If you're serving out of a cache, you've modified the traffic because it's going to your cache instead of the origin server. You need to add or remove headers, uh, redirect so that people trying to go to one website end up at a different one. Uh, if you just want to monitor and track the traffic, which I've seen some people try to do, you should just use a sniffer. Uh, if you're not going to actually change the traffic going through, you shouldn't go to the effort of a proxy. And so this is basically how a proxy works. We have a, ooh, I get to use my pointer now. You just take the original connection and put a proxy right in the middle. So the important thing we're going to come back to again and again is a proxy connection is two connections. We've taken one original connection from the client server and we've converted it into two different connections, one to the client proxy and one to the proxy server. They look like a related and people think they are because the proxies are clever, but they're not in fact in any way really related to each other. And you have to keep that in mind uh, because a lot of the stuff makes sense. And so since there are separate connections, we have two more uh, port address port pairs, which if you look in the previous diagram, we labeled uh, PQ and AB, just because I like those letters. And you say, well, what are those? Those depend on how, what proxy type you pick. And the proxy types we'll talk about 
are directly related to this. They're determined entirely by what address we pick to use for these, this P, P, PQ and AB. So here's our table. So we have four choices. Uh, we have the explicit proxy choice, which is the old style, very old. I don't know, I'm probably the only one old enough to remember this anymore. Uh, where the client connects to the proxy address, and when the server gets a connection, it looks like it comes from the proxy address. That's the explicit proxy. That's not transparent at all. We can do what we call inbound transparent. That's where the client, from its point of view, it's inbound to the proxy, and it see, thinks it's connecting to the server. It does not see the proxy. We can do that on the other side. We can say, well, when the server gets a connection, it thinks it's coming directly from the client. And we can treat these independently because, again, we have two different connections. They're only related because our proxy makes them related. And then we can combine them and be fully transparent where the client thinks it's connecting to the server and the server thinks it's being connected to directly from the client. So let's talk about HTTP proxies. So ATS, after tra Apache Traffic Server, is an HTTP proxy, and it's also a cache. Um, so in order to modify traffic, if you have a proxy and it's modifying the traffic, it has to understand the traffic. It has to know the protocol that's going over there. From ATS point of view, that means we really can only proxy and cache HTTP. The other traffic basically we ATS handles by making it opaque. It just says, I've got a chunk of bytes. I'll just forward that on. Uh, so HTTP, sorry, ATS has a deep understanding of HTTP. It understands HTTP headers. It can go and it can modify them. It can analyze and make decisions based on those headers. Uh, things that it does can rely on data that's in those headers. This, this comes up, but ATS does not understand HTML. That's a completely different language, completely different protocol. You can write plugins that do that, and in fact, some people have. But that's not a, a fundamental. We had to do that. just want to mention that. That does come up. All right, so we have a proxy. We have a network. We're going to put the proxy in the network. So this is our most generic description of what a proxy in your network looks like. You've got a client. You have some sort of networking stuff here. You come to find only some segment which connects directly to the proxy. It connects directly to some other segment. It goes through some other cloudy stuff and hits a server somewhere. Okay? So that's, that's just completely abstract. Uh, but that's, that's the, what we're going to use when we talk about putting the proxy in. Notice it's in line. We'll talk about that again in a bit. So we can talk about the network topology that we use when we put a routed uh, proxy in. Uh, the most common one that I've seen in practice is the routed topology. That means when we look at these two segments here, where's my little button? There we go. These two segments, they're on different networks. So the proxy also serves as a router to move packets between the two networks. Another topology uh, which comes up is bridged. And in that case, we have the same network on those two segments, and the proxy, in, in addition to acting as a route, it doesn't act as a router, but acts as a bridge to move the packet between the networks. Okay. A third option, uh, which we will probably not talk about very much, is WCCP. Has anyone here ever used WCCP? Okay, we got a couple of people. This is a Cisco protocol. It lets you uh, set up a router to do the interception for you and pass stuff over to a web cache or proxy someplace else. Uh, it has a, its main, main nice feature is that it uses Cisco router. Uh, it enables pass-through failovers so if your ATS goes down it'll just not proxy at all, so you still have connectivity. It is, however, IPv4 only, so uh, the utility is somewhat limited there. So we know what a proxy is. We want to put it in network. We said, well, we want to be transparent, right? What's the advantage of transparency? So the essential issue here is that transparency look, makes a proxy topology where you put the proxy in it'll look like it's not there. You see through it. It's transparent. So it looks like that original diagram where the client just connects to the server. And you want to use transparency when you want to hide the proxy from either the clients or the servers. Okay, and hide has a bunch of other things. It means you don't want them to know that it's doing it. It's because you don't want them to have to reconfigure the client, right? Uh, which is actually probably the bigger reason. So if they don't own the proxy there, they don't have to reconfigure. You don't have to tweak their browser data or, they can, uh, or anything like that. Um, it can sometimes be handy to hide it from the server as well. So these are the two questions you need to ask when you're saying, I want to be transparent. Why do I want to be transparent? Who do I want to hide it from? And based on that, we can pick one of our four types. So here's our chart again. And now I've added our hidden stuff to say which type. So if you're an explosive proxy, it's not hidden at all. Inbound transparent hides from the clients, outbound from the servers, and fully transparent hides from both sides. So you need to decide what you want the uh, 
your network to look like once you put the proxy in and make your decision based on that. And ATS, of course, supports all these modes. Um, so let's go through a few example use cases so you can get some idea of uh, why you'd want to do these. So we've talked about the explicit proxy. Uh, pretty much no one really uses this anymore. This was done initially because we didn't have transparency. It was the best you could do. Um, now we can do a lot better. Uh, one example of outbound transparency is for a CDN. So in this case, the proxy is close to the origin servers. And what you want to do is the, uh, you, want it, you want the clients to connect to the proxy address because you don't want them to connect in directly to your, to your origin servers. You want them to go through the proxy. But you want the servers to think that they're talking directly to the clients so that you don't have to, for instance, manipulate HTTP headers so that the servers know which address the client's really coming from. So that's outbound transparent. The servers don't see the proxy, right? Only the clients do. Uh, some, you can also use this, for instance, to put your servers on non routable addresses or IPv6 when your outside network is IPv4 because the, the clients can't see the actual servers, they see the proxy. Uh, inbound transparent, this is not a very common use case. There's a few, uh, few uses of this. Main one is if you want to hide your internal addresses behind a proxy. So you're a corporation, you've got a network, you don't want people seeing what addresses on your network, but you don't want to have to reconfigure all the clients in your corporate net. So you can make inbound transparent, the clients don't see the proxy, they just connect out to the servers as, just as they do without the proxy. But anyone on the other side, the origin servers outside your corporate net, will see the proxy address, not your client address. Uh, if, you just, if that's the only thing you want to do, then you'd use NAT. You do, you'd use inbound transparent when you want to do that, and you also want to uh, modify the traffic. So you want to do caching, and you want to do that. The most common case probably is fully transparent. The proxy isn't visible to client or servers. Uh, this means you don't have any, need any changes on the client side or the server side. Uh, this is the most common corporate use where the corporation decides we need to proxy. We need to have the server see the client addresses because there's things on the server that depends on the client address like uh, you know, Google Mail, for instance. Uh, we don't want to reconfigure all the clients for an explicit proxy. We just want to drop it in and have it work. So if that's what you want to do, that's the fully transparent case. All right, so that's a the basic theory. Uh, I have some uh, interrogation enhancements over here, little, little uh, corporate advertising units. So anyone asks a question can have one of those. So are there any questions? Okay, I need to get better, better swag. Okay. Uh, so. We have the basic theory where you know what we're trying to do. So now the next step, of course, would be to actually put ATS out in your network. So let's talk a little bit about how we do some deployment. All right. The main thing here, uh, so ATS will work in routed bridge and WCCP modes. I've actually tested all of these myself. Uh, we actually have clients running in all three of these modes out in production. The most important lesson from all of this slide uh, well, let's first say, this is your simplified topology. Remember from the previous diagram, we've just stuck a serv traffic server in the middle. It's not just a proxy now, it's traffic server. So we've improved. Um, the key, most key point here is that the traffic server, the proxy has to be in line. The packets both ways have to pass through it. We actually had a problem where the packets were going out traffic server and coming back in through another path. And that's just not going to work. So it has to go packets both ways through the traffic server. Okay, so you have to make sure your topology is going to support that. Uh, now, we said ATS works in all these different modes, and that's so that you can adapt traffic server to your network. So you need to look at your network, decide where you're going to traffic server, decide what topology works best there, and then you can adapt traffic server to suit that. Okay, so don't start with traffic server and say, oh, I think I want to go bridge, I want to go right up. Look at your network. Think what, how can I fit into my network ATS will adapt to you. So none of these is better, right? They're just more or less appropriate for your network. So I want to emphasize that. That's why we have all these different capabilities, not just to confuse you and make you hire consultants like me, uh, but to help you uh, make it work in your network. So let's talk about some generic deployment issues that are going to come up no matter how you deploy it. So your normal packet flow is through the ATS box. We talked about that. What we're going to do is so all the traffic is going to pass through the ATS box. And we need to divert certain of those flows up to ATS while the rest go ahead and pass through. So for instance, pings or telnet will keep going on through the boxes if ATS isn't there. 
what we're going to do is divert those flows that we want to modify. Okay, that's the point of the proxy is changing traffic flows. So what we're going to do is we use IP tables and EB tables to mark the packets to say which ones are of interest to us for intercepting. Uh, we use routing, IP tables and routing to put those, reroute those packets so instead of going through as they normally would, they come up to ATS. We configure ATS to grab those packets and do the uh, work with them, create the two connections out of one and do any modifications we want. And there's a few tweaks we're going to have to do on the host operating system to make it work as well. So again, there's uh, appendices on the slides. The slides are out, um, out on the network. Uh, and other copies are around. You can look through those to see how it is. We're going to go through some more detail on this. Uh, okay, so here's the simplified Linux packet handling that we are run on top of. And this is, in fact, simplified. There are some pieces that are lighted out of this. Uh, but now that I've scared you, we're going we're to simplify this and really look at only the things that we need for traffic server. But I want you to understand that we're just touching the surface when we work with traffic server to do this. We are only scratching the surface of what's actually going on in the hood. Okay? So that's why there's so much scope for going wrong. You can go get all sorts of different places here. So you don't really need to know that. You just need to know uh, it's out there. So the main feature we're going to use is called tproxy, which is sort for transparent proxy. It was put into Linux specifically to support this kind of operation. Um, and what it essentially does is lets you create a socket on the local box that's bound to a foreign address, an address that is not normally associated with the host. Uh, and it, you can access it both through IP tables and socket options. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And it should be present in all my, uh, modern Linux kernels. So you shouldn't, used to, when we first started working this, or you sometimes had to patch the kernel to get this. Uh, you also need to build ATS. Uh, if things work correctly and you have a modern Linux, transparency should just be turned on. Uh, there's some fancy stuff here if you have old kernels and want to fiddle with it, but we don't really need to talk about that. Uh, you need kernel, if you're more recent than this, you should be okay. This is the one gotcha, gotcha that comes up most commonly when people can't build. Uh, the transparency feature requires also POSIX capabilities, which are provided by libcap devil. Well, actually provided by libcap, but you need libcap devil to build with it. Uh, we'll talk about why that is later because, well, transparency is a privileged operation, so uh, we have to do that. So if you can't build, you'll get an error message. If that's the problem, you'll get a nice error message saying, I didn't turn on transparency because I didn't have POSIX capabilities. When it says that, install that package. It's, some distros have it and some don't. All right, so we're going to get ready to deploy. Uh, the more you sweat pre-deployment, the less you'll, you'll scream while you're actually deploying. So I recommend uh, prepping. So some of the things you need to prep for, you decide how you're going to set up ATS, so what type of transparency you're going to use. We're going to use routed, bridge, WCCP. You need to enumerate the server intercept ports. This is, we talked about, you're going to divert flows. So you want to say, well, what flows to the origin servers out there do I want to, to modify? Which ones do I want to proxy? Pick those ports, and those are the ports on the servers, the origin servers outside. And that's important to remember because we're going to talk about a bunch of different ports here. We want to be very clear which ones you're talking about. Those are the services out there. So if you're doing HTTP, it would be port 80. Uh, we're going to pick a firewall mark. We'll talk about that more later. Uh, this is part of the IP tables setup. Uh, you need to select your inbound and outbound interfaces. This requires you to understand which interfaces face the client, which interfaces face the servers. And we have, in fact, had some really nasty problems. We eventually discovered, oh, we had our, our interfaces reversed. They went the other way than we thought. So you want to think carefully about that and make sure you know which interfaces are on the client side, which are on the outside. Uh, ATS has to sit on a port. That's called the ATS proxy port. Uh, you need to pick which one that. And this is, I'm going to hit this again and again and again because this is so important. Verify your clients can connect to your servers before you put ATS out there. Okay, we're going, to do two, we're going to be doing two very complex things. One is setting up all the internal operating system stuff, the IP tables, the EB tables, and all of that, the routing, the bridging, to make it work. And then we're going to put in ATS on top of that. Make sure the bottom half works before you start messing with ATS. Uh, because uh, the, getting the bridge and router stuff working is not the simplest task in the world. Now, here's my fun, fun chart. I had fun with this chart. This is our generic setup. Um, here we have a client, it comes in through some port, it goes into EB tables and IP tables. Some of that, that traffic goes up to the routing table. Selected parts of it, you can see because I've changed the color, 
uh, go up through the loopback interface up to traffic server here, which is listening on its ATS ports. They have these boxes here, so if you want to copy this, and when you're doing pre-deployment, fill in the numbers and the data. Uh, you can do that so that you can refer back to this later when things go wrong and someone says, oh, well, what's your, what are your client interfaces? You can look at your chart and say, yes, this is one. So we're going we're gonna to keep this in mind. I may just pop back to this, uh, but this is basically what it looks like when you're set up. Um, so some cautions, things to keep in mind. Uh, it is in line, so other traffic is going to go through it, so make sure that other traffic is going through it. Uh, the firewall mark and the ATS proxy port you pick, pick are arbitrary and local. So that you have to pick something, but it doesn't really matter much what you pick. You want to pick it to avoid colliding with other things on your box. So if you're writing something at port 8080, don't use that for the ATS proxy port. Uh, so now we're going to talk about the various layers you're going to go through. We'll start with EB tables. Has anyone ever played with EB tables? Well, oh, we got two people who play with EB tables. So this is layer two, um, and all we really need this for for a traffic server is to keep packets from zipping on through on layer two so we can get them up into the routing table and do routing type stuff with them. Uh, other than that, everything happens exactly like the other cases. Uh, the big one here is IP tables. This is fun. I'm sure all of you have played with IP tables, right? Yes. So lots of fun stuff goes on here. This is where we set a firewall mark, and that's going to be used later by routing. Uh, so the firewall mark is 32 bits wide. ATS only needs one bit. If you don't do anything else, you might as well just use the whole thing. And most of the environments I've deployed, there is, in fact, other stuff going on uh, using IP tables. So we had to be careful. So you can just pick one bit out of the 32 bits to make it work. Marking is based on the server port again, not on the ATS proxy port, on the server port that you're going to, so like port 80, and the host interface. That's why we have to be careful about which is the inbound interface and which is the outbound interface, because that's going to show up again here in the IP tables. So what we do for things that are coming inbound that we want to be transparent, we mark them with tproxy, which is required so the ATS can accept that connection even though it's going to an address that's not on the box. Uh, we redirect the traffic up to the ATX proxy port. And this is all for IPv4. You get to do it all again for IP6, IPv6, using IP6 tables if you want to support IPv6. OK. So a big word of warning here. Oh, i got to accelerate here. Uh, IP tables used for a whole lot of things on Linux. So this is the place where you can really collide with other stuff on the box. So all the firewalling, if your Linux is doing any sort of firewalling, it's doing that by using IP tables. So you've got to be very careful about colliding. Uh, so lots of potential cross interference. I, ATS itself only uses the mangle table. I love product, things that have a table called a mangle. Uh, fires confidence. Uh, so you need that. Another thing to watch out for that's very careful is by default, if you just boot up and install Linux, most distros will not allow the traffic through that ATS needs. So you're probably going to have to modify the filter table either directly or use the firewalling uh, GUI interface to change that. That's another reason to test client to server connectivity before you put ATS on the box. Okay, This is a big hang up and it can be really frustrating to try and figure out why it's not happening because you look at the mangle table and it's right, but your fil filter table is stopping all the traffic. Uh, we also use the routing table. We use policy routing to force the packets for the ATS. We are going to ATS up to ATS. Uh, that's what the firewall mark is for. So uh, the, we put a table on the side. This is actually in the simple part. We put an extra routing table on the side. So if it's got the mark, use this routing table instead. So it interferes less with uh, your existing routing. So that's usually pretty easy to get in. Uh, and we have to configure ATS. Um, in ATS, you create your proxy ports. You mark them as transparent in the appropriate way. So if you're inbound transparent, you mark them inbound transparent. Uh, the proxy port has to agree with the IP tables. We've embedded the proxy port in the IP tables command, so it has, you have to make sure it agrees when you configure ATS. Because you filled it out in the little chart, so you can just look there. Uh, the various transparency options that you use up in ATS, uh, ATS land, transparent in, transparent out, transparent full, which is really just transparent in and transparent out. There's a transparent pass-through now. We'll talk about that a little later. You want to be very careful about using any other options on transparent ports because they can easily conflict with transparency. Most of them just simply don't work. So like, for instance, SSL doesn't work. 
Uh, so you're pretty much just going to have those on the transparent ports. Now remember, this is per port. So if you have, you can have transparent inbound ports, transparent outbound ports, explicit proxy ports, SSL ports, all running on ATS at the same time in the same instance. Uh, so you don't have to commit to all of these. And in fact, I, I see that done sometimes where they both have explicit proxy and a transparent proxy. We have to configure the host operating system. This isn't too bad. Basically, you have to enable packet forwarding and you have to disable the reverse path check. It doesn't make any sense to me, frankly, why in the world you'd have to reverse turn off RP filter because the packet should look the same, but you have to. It just will not work if you don't do that. Um, and you can do the routing, and you have to set up your routing or bridge configuration. But of course, you've already done that. Uh, so, specific deploying cases. So there's an appendix, and also online, you'll be able to download the script. This is a script I use when I do testing, so I actually use this on a, uh, well, not a day, quite daily basis, but very frequently to set up my own test systems to test transparency. Uh, this will handle all the routed and bridged cases, either the full case or the half case. Uh, there's another example script that's going to be available. It uses NAT instead of tproxy. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And uh, there's some uh, support files for using WCCP, which we're only going to very touch on because that's, that's a whole talk right there. Oops, I went too fast. So actually, let's just talk very briefly about WCCP. This is your basic setup for WCCP. You have a router. It diverts the package down to ATS and goes out. The configuration here is really effect, almost identical to the routed case. Um, you have to play games with the router there. Uh, and it's an end-of-life Cisco protocol, so Cisco won't help you with it. Uh, basically, gives you remote control policy routing. Uh, and if you're not inbound tra transparent, it's really kind of pointless. Uh, OK, we're just going to, we're just going to, Nobody cares. Uh, ATS plugins. ATS plugins can get a hold of the outbound transparency per connection. Obviously, you can't get a hold of the inbound, but because of the time the connection is there, it's inbound transparent or it's not. There's nothing you can do at that point on that side. But you can uh, flip the trans outbound transparency on and off. Uh, you can tweak with the server address. You can turn on transparency and then change the server address under your users, which is fun. Uh, or there's still a few little bugs on some of the URLs because the uh, the header gets split and is differently on a transparent proxy than on a uh, uh, proxy proxy, and we added we're still still working that out. So you want to be a little careful with that. All right, now the fun part. You've got it up there. So now you know you have a basic start. You have a script with the basic commands. You have a basic idea of what you're trying to do. So you can try to get started, and then you try it, and it doesn't really quite work. So troubleshooting. So you want to try to fix things. Oh, is there any questions on the? first part. Wow, I am a great speaker. This is awesome. Uh, troubleshooting. Let's see. Step one. Make it work without ATS. Yes. See step one. Uh, yes. I can't, you know, people, you're going you're gonna to say, aha, I wouldn't do that. Yes, you will. Um, so think about that. So let's talk about some tools that you can use when it's not quite working. So uh, we'll start with TCP dump. Uh, I don't use it much myself. Other people do. Its main advantages are it's almost always installed, so you don't have to find it anywhere. Uh, there's very few Linux distros that don't have this. It only requires a text interface, so you can uh, SSH in uh, and play with it. You can uh, use it directly to dump TCP traffic. You can make capture files, uh, so you can look at them later. So you can make a capture file and bring it off and examine it later. One great thing to examine, which is my favorite tool here, is Wireshark. You guys, some of us use Wireshark here, surely. I love this tool. I could not have, never have made transparency work without this thing. Uh, if I use TCP dump, I use it to make capture files and look at it in Wireshark. It's wonderful. If you're doing any sort of TCP work or UDP work and you want to see what's going on, Wireshark is just it's awesome. Uh, so I strongly recommend that. Uh, there's IP tables, EB tables, you can go and there's extra commands on them to say, well, show me how many times these particular rules have been hit. And this is really an excellent debugging tool. So you put the IP table rules in and it doesn't look like they're working. You can ask IP tables, well, how often has that been hit? It'll tell you how many uh, total bytes have gone through and how many um, hits. And so you can look at that, run your test and see if those numbers have changed and tell whether your rules are in fact actually working or not. Because otherwise there's really no way to know. Um, so that's, those are in the man pages, not going to go through that. 
you just knowing it's there. I, I did quite a lot of debugging before someone told me about that, and I was like, I only had known earlier. Netstat, of course, this is really handy. This is actually the only Netstat command I actually ever use. It just tells me all the TCP listening ports. So one of the things is, if I, I think I have ATS up, and I think it's listening on this proxy port, but is it really? So, or shut it down and then look and see if there is something else on that port, right? If you want ATS in port 8080, shut down ATS, run this, and you see something on port 8080, there's your problem. Uh, so netstat. Uh, you can do a lot of troubleshooting with ATS logging. ATS has a very uh, excellent logging system to generate a lot of debug messages. Uh, you need to turn it on, you go into the records.config file and you uh, flip that switch there to one from zero. That just makes it possible to get debugging tags, not by itself creating debugging tags, uh, any output. Which you have two ways to do it. If you're firing up traffic server directly from the command line, the actual traffic server process, you can use the dash T option and put tags in. If you want to do it from the records.config, there's the, the config string, you put a string, same format as the uh, T option. Uh, and so these are actually, this is actually a regular expression. So if you put host, it'll match host and it'll match host DB. And this will match tag one, tag two, or tag one, two, or tag two, one. Because it has a little pipe there, which is an or. So this can generate a lot of output. Uh, we'll talk about some of the more handy um, tags when we go through our checklist. So, any other? No questions. All right. What? If you're acting as a browser if, and you have uh, multiple VLAN tags on your, uh, on your trunk line, then you uh. can't deploy transparency. But if you have only one uh, specific tag, then it's easy to configure using the interfaces. Not really a question, but. Well, no. You should say, did you know that? Then it's a question. <laughs> OK, so uh, I put up a troubleshooting checklist. Just This is not the only thing you should do, but it's, it's, a, it's a ni again, a nice start for things you can do uh, when you want to try to fix it. So you know, remove all the ATS, EB tables, IB tables, all that. Do you have connectivity? Fire up ATS, check in your processes. Uh, here's some uh, error message places you should look at. Traffic.out is uh, over in the uh, var, log, var log traffic server area. That's where all the debugging output will go. Even if you don't have debugging turned on, ATS does a lot of checks when it fires up transparency and will generate error messages uh, if something's gone wrong. Like, for instance, you've turned on transparency and it didn't actually compile transparency, you will, in fact, get an error message saying, yo, that's not going to work. It's not built with transparency. Uh, there's an error log where other messages will show up. Sometimes you need to look in dmessage because very early on in the ATS process, it, it doesn't, hasn't configured itself enough to actually put out to the uh, normal error logs and it'll do some syslogging. So that's something you might check to make sure everything's coming up correctly. Review your configuration. I know that sounds silly, but you know, just make sure, uh, check, you know, especially do cross checks on this. Make sure you, uh, the, uh, the values agree, that's a great way to get lost there. Um, then start capturing. I usually start capturing from the client side. So I get my TCP dump or I get my Wireshark. I go to the client side. I say, are the client connections even showing up here? Am I getting sends in? Am I getting Synax back? Am I seeing the actual HTTP connection request come in? Uh, ATS is always going to live on the loopback because of the transparency issue. If you're transparent, it's going to be on the loopback. Uh, are you seeing the, the client SYN packets go up to the loopback? Is ATS even seeing the SYNs at all? Is it sending the Synax back? Then look at the server side. Are you seeing any, any SYN Synax coming out on that side? Are you seeing requests come out? You can check the ATS logs to see if it's recording connections. Um, that's actually kind of handy to do if it looks like it's working, but the proxying doesn't seem to be working. It might be that the connections are going straight through without hitting ATS at all. So you want to check the ATS logs in that case to say, well, does ATS actually see the connections? All right, some additional notes of things to watch out for. Be very careful using IP addresses to figure out where these packets are. Oop, ah, okay, thanks. All right, I'll speed up here. I'm going too slow. Um, because we're messing with the IP source and destination address, the whole point of transparency, 
when you look at those packets, you can no longer be sure where actually they came from. Okay? You see the exact same packet with the exact same uh, four tuple on both the client side and the source side. So just be a little careful. There's MAC addresses. These are handy. Uh, we're trying to figure out where these packets are actually originating. Uh, some of the tools will show you an IP ID as part of the tracing. They'll match that up for you so you can look at that and make sure you just be very careful when you look at those packets that you, you explicitly check which connection they're from because it can get very confusing. Uh, you just have to be, it's an easy way to get lost looking at stuff. All right, so we talked about this, so we'll talk about, won't talk about it again. Here's some useful tags. These are the ones I find most useful. The host DB and the DNS tags will let you see how ATS is trying to look up uh, origin servers. So you can see if ATS is seeing the connections that trying to find the origin servers. HTTP accept is on the inbound side. It tells you whether ATS is actually accepting connections. There's a tproxy tab, which just gives you some extra data about tproxy operations. And all this goes out to traffic.out. So there's a few other ones. You want to be a little careful. You want to avoid just the HTTP tag, because that generates just unreal amounts of output. Because uh, it gives you every little thing that happens in every single HTTP transaction. You don't want to go there unless you really need to look into that. Whoops. WCCP troubleshooting, one person said don't, just, just replace it, but um, you can look at that. Uh, if you really want to talk to WCCP, bug me elsewhere who don't really have time to deal with that. Let's go really quickly through some potential issues that we've gotten. All of these have happened out in the field from real people that I've talked to or have tried to get help from me. Uh, so uh, this is all field experience. Uh, Origin server address, one thing you can do is the origin server gets resolved twice. The client resolves it when the original sets up a connection, the ATS reads the header and resolves it. You can get around that by setting this uh, config parameter. You lose some control because you, the client gets to decide what the address is. Uh, something to be aware of. Uh, one of the people who use this said they, they turn this on all the time because then they don't have to configure good DNS around ATS. The client's already got the address, just use it. Uh, you can also do this with the port. By default, when ATS binds the outgoing port on the client side connection, on the server side connection, it just uses a random port. But you can tell it to um, use the same source port that the client does. So the origin server not only is the same address, but the same port. Um, no, that's completely wrong. I'm looking at a different slide. Uh, address binding. Uh, one of the things ATS lets you do is bind addresses to your proxy ports. This doesn't work with transparency because the address, the binding address, is determined by the client and the server, not by what's on the, the proxy. So the IP and IP out at options for use to do this just don't work. So that's why it's always on the loopback because it doesn't, it's not going to have any local address. Oh, well, there's the port transparency slide, and it was here somewhere. So we talked about this. There's actually some issues here. There's, a, there's actually a Linux problem where if you uh, bind to foreign addresses and use a port zero to say, give me any port, it only has one pool for that, only 64K ports. So if you're trying to push out 50, 60,000 simultaneously outbound connections, you can run out of ports even though you're connecting to several hundred different origin server addresses and you think, well, I shouldn't have a problem. If you explicitly bind it, then this doesn't happen. Not sure why, that's just the way Linux is. Um, keep alive, there's, uh, ATS tries to keep the server side alive as much as possible, even if the client side goes down. If you're doing transparency, this can lead to some odd effects. The client can shift its port around without the uh, traffic server side uh, seeing that change in the port. It doesn't seem to matter very often. I haven't heard a lot of complaints about this. Uh, but there are, we did put the use source port in precisely because some, uh, there were a couple of people who, who didn't like this. Uh, HTTPS, uh, if you're going to proxy HTTPS, it can be done. You have to have certificates or convince the clients that your certificates are valid. You want to be careful of that. It's not a big deal if you're a CDN, you know all the certificates anyway. Uh, but you can't just slap an SSL on the proxy port option and expect that to work. You can blind tunnel it. Uh, check the IP addresses. Generally, I don't see the point of that. You might as well just not even intercept them if you're, just, if you're not going to proxy them. Uh, this is an option that was put in recently so that there's a protocol out there that use port 80 and look like HTTP but aren't really. ATS will, will barf on those because it says that's not an HTTP header and I don't accept invalid headers. There's a patch in now on trunk that you can set this to say, well, if the header doesn't parse, 
just blind tunnel it from there on and go on out. So that's a little dangerous. You want to use with caution, but it might be used necessary. Uh, this is kind of an odd thing. Uh, by default, if you're doing explicit proxying, uh, there's no, you can have an IPv4 inbound and IPv6 outbound. They're just separate connections, so there's no reason for them to use the same IP address. Or anything. But if you're transparent, you can't do that because you, you're preserving an address, so naturally you're also preserving the family. So inside, it'll, it'll force it to always use the uh, client family because there's, well, there's nothing else you can do. Something to keep in mind. Uh, so in general, you can still remap even while you're transparent. This can get a little dangerous because the client and the server will think that the server is a different IP address. Um, I have code in there that if you're, if you're using the server address, if you use the client, uh, so if you're not doing the dance lookup address in ATS and you're just using the client one, it, doesn't, it, does, it prevents that after you remap. I don't know why I did that. Uh, I've got a request to change that. Uh, and if you're doing plugins, then you can do really uh, sophisticated things. Uh, but just keep in mind, if you are doing wrapping, then you can have this IP address divergence, uh, which can cause problems. Uh, Windows Update, for instance, won't work in that case. Uh, the biggest drawback, I'd say, at this point is that Linux is really required. It doesn't, it doesn't really work on other operating systems. Uh, it turns out, oddly, that it's not the T-proxy stuff that you need so much, but the POSIX capabilities. And the issue is that transparent binding is a privileged operation, so either we need that or we have to run traffic server process itself as root. And we really don't want to do that. That's just, that's just too dangerous for us to recommend in any circumstances. Uh, but, you know, if you want it to work in other operating systems, volunteer. We're happy to, uh, happy to take patches or any help on that uh, that you want to put up. Uh, this was a fun one. I found this out from one of my clients. Script kitties. So uh, this client has, uh, does ISP type stuff. So they're trying to boost their bandwidth, uh, improve client experience without having to buy more bandwidth on the uh, outside. So, but if you have ATS up and you've captured intercepted port 80, then port 80 works for any outbound address, right? ATS has no way of knowing uh, that there's no server on the other side until after it's accepted connection. So the script keys out there trying to do port probing will find success on every single address they try. Now, yeah, this is script keys because the professionals will figure this out very quickly and move on. It's the, uh, it's the college students who think they're clever with some Perl stuff they downloaded that's a problem. Uh, it's not a big deal, something to keep uh, in mind. Um, if you see just all these massive port 80 things coming in with, that don't ever actually go anywhere. Uh, okay, all right. So I think we're, we're, yeah, we're doing good on time. So let me go one last slide, some resources you have. Uh, ATS has online documentation, wiki, mailing list, yada, yada, yada. Go to that address. Oh, you can get to every one of those things from that address. They're all listed there. Uh, I provide consulting services there. And we have a very large contingent, my peanut gallery, of traffic server people here at the conference. So that's a real bonus if you're actually here. There's a bunch of them there, and there's some more over here. We have like, what, 15, 16 traffic server developers, users, community members. Uh, meet them, greet them, buy them beer. Uh, it's not getting them talking that's a problem. It's getting them to shut up. Uh, so I would, if you're going to do transparency, I would strongly recommend meeting at least some of them to, to, to get involved with some of those. Um, so yeah, the scripts, they're just starting points. Uh, and those are, well, you, these are going to be online. This is just uh, some example, uh, configuration examples. So this is, this is what you'd look like here. This would be in the records.config on ATS. If you set up port 8080, V4, fully transparent. And then the same thing on port 80 for uh, IPv6. There's the pass-through option, which says if you have a parse failure, just pass it on through on port 9090. Uh, so these scripts are um, intended to work from a cold start. So you bring up the system, you run it. You'll want to pick out the pieces if you don't want to do it always from a cold start. Um, so that's not so bad. Uh, again, that's, gonna be, that's online, so you can just download it. You don't have to type it in from the from the, uh, the thing. You can do it with that. Uh, read the slides if you want to see that. Um, it's pretty simple, actually. This is the fun part of NAT. That's it. That's your IP table stuff for NAT. Of course, you don't get any, uh, you can't use the client address because it gets destroyed. 
uh, by the NAT, WCCP, yeah. All right, there we go. Okay, we got swag, so are there any questions now? <laughs> oh, there we got one. Well, no, because you, you've put the. Okay, uh, what he's asking about is if you have outbound transparent, you're in forward proxy mode, you're outbound transparent, how do the packets get back through ATS to the client? Right? Okay, well, we've put the proxy between the client and the server. And so when the server, when an outbound transparent, the server thinks it's talking directly to the client. So it's going to use the client address. So the routing is going to take the packet back toward the client. And you simply have to make sure your network topology is such that packets coming back from outside with the client address will go through the ATS box. That's part of the whole topology setup to make sure that your packets are going through it both ways. And yes, we've had an instance where that wasn't the case and it doesn't work. So the outbound transparent is used uh, more often on the, I would think, on the CDN side. So the ATS is close to the servers, and you don't want to muck about. You want to make it easier for your origin servers to look at the, the client's address. So that's a more normal use case. You get, you get that. OK. Any other questions? <laughs> I have a question. So about six months ago, uh, Cisco announced or, or made it official an, an update to the WCCP protocol. Is that official? Yes. Oh. It's on the IETF list. And it includes a uh, change to the protocol that adds multiple address families, including IPv6. How come Traffic Server doesn't have this yet? Because I haven't seen the spec. I wasn't. I sent it to you six months ago. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, yeah, well, the real question is, is Cisco going to unend of life it, though? They'll up the relationship spec, but they still won't support it. Because one of the problems with the end of life is that I can't actually get, there's parts of the protocol I had to packet level debug to make it work with transparency at all. Uh, because they wouldn't, it's not documented and they wouldn't tell me, no, that's end of life. Go away. All right. Well, I guess I'll let you go then. Oh, do we have another question? Cluster, well, I think clustering works with transparency. Is Ming Zim here? Do you guys run transparent at all? I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work with clustering. I don't know if anyone's actually tried that. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, cluster is working in most uh, variants. Uh, and uh, the released uh, um, master tree. But if you want to run uh, for the WCCP, I'm not sure it will, it will work for you. You may try it. Yes, uh, I'm the com committer. Yeah, it's kind of independent because that communication goes through different mechanisms and the, the client to server traffic. All right, well then, thank, oh. Uh, does anyone here know uh, SSL Sniff or Fiddler or any of those tools? Um, it would seem, could be a pretty cool feature if we could implement something like that as either as a plugin or a feature in the transparent proxy. So it would automatically sign certificates that are trusted inside a LAN. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am. There's some serious issues with, with fiddling with certificates, and I, we don't have the scope to go into them here. Um, so I'd be very cautious with that. You, you got something like that? Are you going to release it as plug-in? <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you all for coming. <laughs>